dismiss our kids for kids' questions. So you can walk through the go. Will you uh, take a moment with me? Let's pray for our children's workers. Pray for our children. As they spend this time in the service dedicated to our kids, let's just pray that our children see Christ through this special time. That adults have taken time from their lives from being here in the service to teach them about Christ. What a great joy to know our children have come to Christ. How many of your parents have known that joy in your life? Your children come to Christ. Let's pray for our workers. Pray for our kids. Father, right now we pray for our children's workers as they go into this time of teaching uh, our children. We pray, Lord, that not only would they see Christ, but they would hear you. And, Lord, that you'd even now prepare the hearts of those children to trust you. Thank you for the blessing that our children's workers are. We pray now a greater measure of blessing in their lives for their willingness and their sacrifice to spend this time. Lord, we come to this time now as we open your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would enable me to be able to teach your word, the power of your spirit, and in your love, that there would not only be clarity of what your word says, but, Lord, we would hear you speak through this time. We pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to pick back up in a series that we left off some time ago, 10 Habits for Every, every Healthy Family. And so you have to ask, what are those 10 habits that we're talking about? Those are the 10 commandments. How many of you remember that series we started a while back? A couple of you do. Okay, it's a good thing we're starting over. I thought I'd pick up the first message again and start over. Well, written more than 3,500 years ago in divine shorthand, these 10 commands serve a Blueprint for long families. And over the next number of weeks, I'll just release that God's ten commandments that are wealthy and strong families. These are the ten commandments for relationships. First, and second, and third. And really, God's blueprint to have healthy and fulfilling and lasting relationships with Him as well as with each other. They are the secret to growing strong and healthy and vibrant families. And we're going to spend the next number of weeks walking through these ten commandments. But by way of introduction, since we've been away from this series a little bit, I want to just kind of revisit briefly why this series is so important, not just to me, but it is important to you and so vital and relevant to our nation today. It goes without saying that America... And our families are in dire trouble. Would you agree with that? Amen. That the healthy American family is rapidly turning from bad to worse. From a low-grade infection to life-threatening gangrene. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of reasons for this. Marriage. A long-standing core tradition and foundation of our nation is no longer respected, no longer accepted, no longer the norm. People are waiting longer to get married, if they get married at all. In fact, many are opting out of marriage completely. People are having fewer children. And less than 46% of those marriages that have children, less than 46% are going to be raised in a two-parent home. Now, if you took a consensus across our nation, most people would say, you know, cohabitating, living together, and single-parent homes are a detriment to our society. We know that. We see that. The fact is, it's true. The facts don't lie. Roughly 70% of all prison inmates in America, 70%, mm. come from fatherless homes. Between the years 1987 and 2007, our prison population in America tripled, making it the highest per capita in the world. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children come from 
fatherless homes, 32 times higher than the average. 85% of our children who show behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. You see, we don't have to go very far to figure out that the health and the stability of our American family is being devastated by an epidemic called fatherlessness. It would be interesting, even in this size of a crowd, to do a survey and find out how many of you grew up having a father figure in your life that was stable, that was strong, that gave you the direction to prepare you for life. David Leichenhorn, an author, the author of the book called Fatherless America, says that fatherlessness is the most harmful demographic trend of this generation. He goes on to say that the engine driving most social problems, from crime to adolescent pregnancy to child sexual abuse to domestic violence and against women, is fatherlessness. The great problem today, said another, is not delinquent kids or dropout dad, dad pardon me, is not delinquent kids but dropout dads and misguided moms who have failed to, to hand down God's truth from one generation to another. For the most part, a juvenile delinquent is simply a child trying to act like his parents. It was the 5th century B.C. philosopher Plato who said this, that the life of the nation is the life of the family written large. Mm -hmm. The life of the nation is the life of the family written large. Well, this morning we're going to step back into this series, 10 Habits of Every Healthy Family, by looking at the very first habit, putting God first. In fact, it comes from the very first commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, verses 2 through 3 say this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and here it is, you shall have no other gods before me. Amen. You shall have no other gods before me. Putting God first is the main ingredient, the top ingredient for growing strong families. But let me just make a, 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 an important observation here that may seem so obvious I don't need to say it, but I think I need to say it. This commandment, this habit, this priority comes from God. The highest and the ultimate of all authorities, higher than man, higher than government, higher than institution, higher than a king. And in other words, this command, this priority, this habit is non-negotiable. And God is saying if you want to have a healthy and strong and lasting and vibrant family, you must learn what it means to put me first. Have no other gods before me. Would you agree with that? Amen. Amen. So what we're dealing with here is not a suggestion. It's not a law that is liable to change from one generation to the next, but this is an absolute, a priority, a universal truth that is true for every generation of every people that ever live. <coughs> putting God first. So how do you do that? How do you put this to work in your life? How does it benefit our lives? I want to suggest to you that there are three ways or three benefits of putting God first in your life. <coughs> And I want to unpack each one of these with you this morning. First benefit I see is that it releases us to live a fulfilling life. That when you put God first, it releases you to live life to the fullest. You'll never get the most out of life until you learn what it means to put God first. Second, it rescues us from a life of failure. You see, we don't have to worry about living our lives, climbing that ladder, getting to the very top rung, only to realize as you get to the top rung of your life that I've set my ladder against the wrong wall. Putting God first rescues you from living a life of failure. And third, it rewards a life of faithfulness. The payoff of putting God first is worth it. The payoff of putting God first is more than worth it. Amen. You see, we're not only the greatest contribution to this present generation, but you're also making the greatest legacy for the next when you put God first. 
So let's unpack these three commands or these three uh, benefits. First of all, it releases us to a life of fulfillment. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Someone sent me a text a while back and the words went like this. Life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It is pointless. <laughs> and that's in essence what this verse is saying. God is saying that when you do not put me first, your life will be pointless. It won't make sense. You're going to wander aimlessly, wondering what is life all about? Where am I going? What does it all mean? And God says that when you put me first, suddenly life is going to take on not only fulfillment and meaning, but you'll have direction in your life. You see, these eight words, you shall have no other gods before me, serve literally as a roadmap to the most fulfilling relationship you'll ever have in your life. A personal relationship with the true and living and one almighty God. God is in essence saying this. Don't have any other gods before me. In other words, don't have a relationship with any other God but me. Would you circle those words, have no other gods? Have no other gods. Those words are packed full of meaning. And let me just try to unpack them a little bit for you this morning. The kind of relationship that God is talking about here, these words are relationship intensive, by the way. The kind of relationship that God has in mind here is not merely a casual relationship, uh, knowledge, but rather the kind of relationship that he's talking about of having no other gods is God is saying, I want you to have with me the most intimate and the most personal kind of relationship you could possibly have. And he uses an analogy that makes sense to us. It speaks to our lives. God oftentimes talks about his relationship with us in an analogy of marriage. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 32, God says this, that he has been a husband to the nation of Israel. And that is exactly what God is saying to you and to me. God is saying, I want to have the closest, most intimate personal relationship I can possibly have with you that is analogous to a human relationship called marriage. Now, I'd say that's pretty close, wouldn't you? Would you? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And God is saying, listen, I want to be so close to you that I am your closest, most intimate friend. I'm the one who knows you better than anyone. I'm the one who you can bring anything to at any time and know that I'm going to love you, that I'm going to trust you, that I'm going to be there for you. I want to be the greatest, most personal, intimate relationship you have. I don't know about you, but I am, I'm amazed by that. Mm -hmm. And God says this when you make me the most important relationship, guess what? Life is going to make sense. You will find fulfillment. You see, you were made to have a relationship with God and your life will never, ever be complete without it. Jesus said it this way. It's a command perhaps that we're so familiar with we don't hear it anymore, but Jesus said the exact same thing when someone came to him and said, what is the greatest commandment of all? What did Jesus say? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with most of your heart. <laughs> with most of your soul. With most of your mind. No. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. He is talking about the closest, most intimate relationship you can ever have, and that must be God. And when you do that, life begins to make sense. He said, for many people, it's not that God is not important. It's that He's not important enough. If you ask many people, do you believe in God? They say, yeah, I believe in God, but He's really nothing more than a religious relic or a family tradition. He's important, but He's not important enough because they don't realize that God wants to have a personal, highly personal, the most intensive personal relationship you could possibly have with anyone. What kind of relationship do you have with God right now? 
one of the ways to measure that relationship and that sincerity of that is to examine your life, examine your day. Am I spending time in God's Word? Am I doing it out of devotion, not out of duty? Not fulfilling a religious tradition to simply say, okay, I knocked that one off for the day. But rather, I'm opening God's Word because I want to read His love letter to me. And I want to hear His voice speaking to my life. What's your prayer life like today? Is it like breathing for you? It's so natural to switch into prayer that you hardly notice that you did. Because your relationship with God is so close, so real, so present. Years ago, this was driven home to me. The importance of putting God first and how it releases us to a life of fulfillment. I will never forget the day I was boarding an airplane. I was seven years of age. The plane's destination was Dallas, Texas, and I sat down next to this kindly elderly couple who I had no idea of the enormous impact they would have on my life for Jesus Christ. They became, if you will, my grandmother and my grandfather, though I did not even know them. Their names were Harvey and Dorothy Hoff. It wasn't long before I sat next to Harvey and Dorothy that I learned that these were full-on followers of Jesus. Harvey would share Jesus at the drop of a hat no matter where he was at. It didn't matter if he was in prison or if he was in a jail or a nursing home, on the street, in the store, or on a plane seat. He didn't care. And I heard about Jesus that day. You see, it hadn't always been that way for Mr. Hoff. There was a time in his life that he was a very successful businessman, building a thriving business. Had a wonderful family, a wife, children, beautiful home. Everything a person could possibly want to have a fulfilling life, or so you would think. And as he, was, as he was into his 60s, he came home one day from a long day of work and he sank down into his lazy boy chair and he began to ask himself some serious questions. What does this really mean? <coughs> something, something deep and haunting, something was missing from his life. It didn't take him long as he sat and began to think about it. That something that was missing was God. A personal relationship with the living God. Shortly after this, he invited Jesus Christ to be his Savior and Lord. And his life dramatically changed. And his life changing impacted my life deeply for many, many years after. You have no idea of the impact that your life will have when you are faithful and walk with God and say, God, you are number one. Amen. And you don't know how many people are going to be so deeply impacted for eternity because you have made that commitment to say, God, you're the most important relationship I'll ever have. And the good and the blessing and the joy and the peace that you will usher into people's lives because you're pointing them to Jesus Christ through your relationship with Him. It's astounding. I later learned that Mr. Hoff lived to be 93 years of age. And he always told me, Jesus is coming back soon, John. Jesus is coming back soon. He believed it so much, in fact, he wrote a book on it. Published it in 1990. He had a huge and enormous impact in my life. But you see, he realized his life turned from success to significance when he trusted Christ. From emptiness to fulfillment. Jesus said it this way, What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? 
Is anything worth more than your soul? Anything? So the first benefit of putting God first is it releases us to a life of fulfillment. Second is it rescues us from a life of failure. It rescues you from a life of failure. I can't think of a greater tragedy that is needless in life than to have run the race of life and come to the finish line and cross that finish line only to realize that you have spent your entire life, all of its energy, all of its effort, all of its hope, all of its dreams, and you've run the wrong race. Mm. <coughs> when we put Christ first in our lives, it rescues us from a life of failure. Why? Because it protects us from worshiping false gods. You shall have no other gods before me. The psalmist describes that person who has spent their entire life running this race, gaining the success of this world, only to break the finish line and realize that they have run the wrong race. Psalm 73 says they are destroyed in a moment. Listen, they are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. They realize with sudden and startling clarity and terror that they had run the wrong race. They had not followed after God. They had chased after the false gods of the world. And their end is swift and final and irreversible. And much worse, much worse, they realize, I believe, that it didn't have to end that way. So how does putting God first protect us from the life of failure? It protects us from serving false gods. You shall have no other gods before me. Let me just be candid about this verse because I think most of us listening to this, or most people, as they hear this verse, they say, you know what? That, that commandment... It lost its shelf life more than 3,500 years ago. We don't believe in gods. When's the last time you heard somebody say, no, I'm going to go worship the god of Ammon? That is the god of wind in Egypt. I'm going to go worship the god of Ra, that is the god of sun in Egypt. I'm going to go worship the god of Osiris, that is the god of death in Egypt. Or their light counterparts, the Canaanite gods, Baal, the god of wind and storms, Asherah, the god of fertility and warfare. And many people look at this man and they say, this is, this is silly. We don't worship gods anymore like this. It doesn't even make sense. This commandment is out of touch with reality. It is archaic. It is obsolete. And there are a lot of people who believe that, aren't there? Years ago when I was in college, I was working for UPS, and I remember one of the co-workers snapped once, you know, I don't believe in the Bible. It's archaic, it's obsolete, it's old-fashioned, it doesn't make sense even for today. But is that true? No. I would suggest to you that we have as many gods as the ancients did, if not more today. I found noted speaker, columnist, and author, Dennis Prager, who also is a Hebrew scholar. Mm -hmm. I found his work on the Ten Commandments to be tremendously insightful. And he says that this first commandment is the mother of all commandments. And he points out that if we follow it, it will remove one of the greatest barriers of good in the world, false gods. You see, the Bible says that there is only one God. It's very clear about that. Isaiah, God says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. There is no God besides me. Amen. And so Prager says, you know, believing in one God benefits our world in a number of powerful, powerful ways. First of all, he says this, because there is one God, there is one Creator, and therefore we are made in this image, that means there is only one, listen carefully, there is only one human race. Amen. 
There are not multiple races because there are not multiple gods that were created in the image of, but rather there's only one God in whose image we are made in, and therefore there's only one human race. Amen. Well, guess what? That throws out the race card, doesn't it? Sure does. Second, he says, because we have one race, which we're created in the image of God, we are also equal in value. That no one person is intrinsically more valuable than the other person. Why? Because we have one human race made in the image of God, and we are all of equal value. One human race. We are all equal in value. And third, he says this, if there is only one God, and therefore there's only one lawgiver, that means there's only one moral standard. So if murder is wrong for one person, it is wrong for everyone. If lying is wrong for one person, then lying is wrong for everyone. Therefore we have one moral standard. So we have one human race, who are one in equality, and there's one moral standard. He goes on to say, bad things happen in the world when we begin to entertain the belief of false gods. And you say, well, what, what kind of false gods do we have today? Oh, we have a lot of them. Money, power, prestige, education, pleasure, patriotism. I mean, you could go on and on, couldn't you? That our culture has a multitude of polytheistic gods that we believe in and serve and you, we surrender our lives to as being more important than the one God who created us and whose image we're made in. Let me give you a couple of examples. Education. We live in a country that has incredible ease of gaining an education. And a good education prepares you for life. Everyone would agree that's a good thing. Obviously, I agree with that. But if education becomes more important to you than God, if it becomes your very moral compass, if it becomes higher than God for you, bad things happen. Take, for instance, Nazi Germany, World War II. Some of the most highest educated people were the greatest and strongest supporters of Adolf Hitler. Hmm. Soviet Union, Stalin, some of the greatest and staunchest supporters of the genocide that impacted millions and millions and millions were the highest educated people of the Soviet Union. Mao Zedong, China, whose genocide again impacted millions and millions of people taking innocent lives was supported by financially, intellectually, some of the most brilliant and most educated minds in the world. Hmm. Then when you make education the moral compass of your life, when it becomes a God, small g, it brings bad things into the world. Let me give you another example. Love. Everyone loves love. Don't you love love? I love love. Love, 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 love. Good. <laughs> but love is only good when we don't put love of God above God. But when we make love our God, when we set it above God, bad things come into the world. You see, without love, that is, by God's moral guidance... We do not promote or protect others. We instead selfishly hurt and destroy them. Let me give you an example. Not too many years ago, I had the opportunity to visit India, spent a number of uh, days there, northern India in particular. And if you're familiar with northern and southern India, you know that that's where the Taj Mahal, one of the seven wonders of the world is. A huge, ornate, marble, white mausoleum that is held as one of the seven wonders of the world. But what many people don't know is that this mausoleum is an epitome of love that was built by Shah Jahan for his wife who died giving birth to their 14th child. I know why she died. Yeah. This 17th century tomb 
surrounded by buildings, covers a sprawling 42-acre uh, complex. It is stunning to look at. Our guide told us that it took some 22,000 plus engineers, architects, laborers to build this massive edifice dedicated to love. Some 22 years. And then he said this. When this, this magnum opus of love was completed, Shah Jahan then took every single labor, architect, engineer, labor, and cut their thumbs off so that they would not reproduce the same work that they built for him. Hmm. When you set love above God, it does not promote or protect, but instead destroys others' lives. We serve gods, don't we? Education, love, money. It turns out that this, this commandment is not obsolete at all. In fact, it is absolute. He shall have no other gods before me. It rescues us from a life of ultimate failure. Third, it rewards us for a life of faithfulness. And the third benefit of putting God first is that it's the greatest, listen carefully, I want you to hear this, because you need to hear this again. You want to make a significant contribution, the greatest impact in your children's lives, in your grandchildren's lives, and for some of you, your great-grandchildren's lives, then you put God first. You have no idea of the enormity of the impact that you will have because they see in your life it's not merely lip service, it is life service of saying God is number one. And the most important place that this takes place is in your home. It has to first begin in your home. How many times have I heard somebody say to me, you know, my grandmother, she was a solid Christian and she so impacted my life. My grandfather, I'll never forget him. He was always reading his Bible and he talked so kindly of the Lord Jesus. His love for God so deeply impacted me. You have no idea of how you will invest in the generations to come the greatest contribution you could ever give in your legacy of faith. You see, if your kids see you as making a relationship in life more important than God, whether that's money, education, or pleasure. If God takes a back seat in your life and they see you only giving lip service to God, oh, we go to church. We don't miss it. We're faithfully there. But they don't see you faithfully there at home. Your kids don't want to see religion. They want to see relationship. How do I have this relationship with this one true living and holy God? That's what they're looking for. Paul says this, Fathers, parents, bring your children up in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. Make Scripture central in how you apply it to your life and how it's lived out in your home. Because if you don't, you're going to leave your children disillusioned and even cynical about God. Listen to what the psalmist says. We will not hide these truths from our children. What truths? The truths of God's Word. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord and about His power and His mighty wonders. For He issued laws to Jacob and He gave His instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them. Even the children not yet born. And they turn and in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God. Not forgetting the glorious miracles and obeying His commands. Then listen what it says. Then, then they will not be like their ancestors. Stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful refusing to give their hearts to God. Your faith 
is the greatest contribution that you'll ever make to your children and the generations that proceed from them. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you are famous or unknown. The greatest contribution you could ever make, the greatest impact on the world, is for those who know you best to see Christ best in you. This has driven home to me when I read about a young man who was born in the 1800s in Germany. His father was a wealthy and successful merchant, and he was Jewish. And his father faithfully led the family in their Jewish practices each week until, that is, the family moved to another town in Germany. And there, this little boy's father discovered that business was not going as well as he had hoped. And so he made some changes in his worship. Soon after they arrived, the father announced that they would no longer be attending the synagogue. Instead, they'd be going to the Lutheran church. Surprised, the little boy asked his father, he said, why are we changing places of worship? And the father told him, son, this is for business reasons. There are so many Lutherans in this town that I can make good business contacts at the Lutheran church. Mm. It will be good for business. This young man had a deep heart and desire to know God. He became so disillusioned by his father's lack of genuine faith that the quest for God in his heart died. And he realized that his father's convictions, his father's faith, were not real at all. God was the first for his father. Something deep inside this little boy died. And he turned against God with a vengeance. This same little boy grew up, of course, and then moved to England, and he became a writer, and he was so well known as a writer, his name became known to many. His name is Karl Marx. Mm. And he wrote what is called the Communist Manifesto. And Marx believed that religion was nothing more than an opiate of the masses. God is a fraud. And anyone who believes in God doesn't know what they're talking about. The irony is that Marx's own legacy went from bad to worse. Two of his own daughters and son-in-law took their own lives through suicide. Three of his children died from malnutrition. He drank heavily. He didn't work. And he eventually died in despair. I wonder, don't you? I wonder how it could have been so different for this man's life had his father put God first. <coughs> how different can it still be for your children's lives? for your grandchildren's lives? How different can you still make a difference in this world by putting God first? You shall have no other gods before me. How does that benefit our lives? It releases us to live a life of fulfillment. Anything less than living for God holds us back from getting the most out of life. It rescues us from a life of failure. We don't have to worry about getting to the top of that ladder of life, <coughs> climbing every rung uphill, only to realize we've placed the ladder of our lives against the wrong wall. And it rewards us for our faithfulness. The greatest way you can make a contribution, not only in the present world, but in the world to come, is through a genuine faith in God by putting Him first. Will you pray with me?
Will you answer this question in your heart and your mind right now? Is God first? Is God number one? Is your relationship with Him real? And if so, how? Or is it merely lip service that God is important to you, but He's not important enough? God is saying to you right now, I gave my son on the cross and I paid an enormous price to demonstrate the genuineness and the distance that I will go in my love for you. God wants to have a personal and intimate and fulfilling relationship with you. And he's asking you right now, will you turn to him? And maybe you're here this morning and you know that you've put other gods before the one and only true God. Would you ask him to forgive you? Would you allow him to search your heart and your mind, say, God, what have I placed in my life above you? What have I allowed to be that moral compass? What have I allowed to be greater value to me than you? Show me that I may turn from it and ask your forgiveness. Help me to make you the most important relationship in my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never had a personal relationship with a living and holy God. And God is inviting you to do that right now. It is by faith alone that we enter into this relationship. It is by faith alone that He works powerfully and makes Himself known to us in our heart, in our minds, in our lives. And so by faith right now, by trusting Him, believing His Word, that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. That His death atoned for your sins to purchase your forgiveness so that you could enter into that relationship with Him. And by faith right now, would you say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you came and you died on the cross. You were buried and you rose again triumphantly on the third day. All so that I could have a relationship with you. Lord, I want that relationship. And I ask, Lord, would you be first in my life? Would you come into my life and make yourself known? And show me what it means to have a real, living relationship with the one true God. Help me, Father, I pray, to live a life of fulfillment following you. Forgive me, Lord, why I made gods more important than you, whatever they may be. And Lord, help me to live this life of love and relationship with you. That it's so real. That it's so evident that my children see it. My grandchildren see it. That others see it as well. Help me to make a difference. Because I put you first in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.